So our focus in a lot of cases is the end user, those people interacting with these systems that we look at, those systems that we create, we modify, we design. We need to figure out where do we go from here. And so we've got our, in, in the case of our project, You've got your project somewhat identified, and you'll see some feedback as we go through this week. These take a little bit of time to read. So on Sunday nights, I have four classes that all come due. These kind of get pushed a little further back because they take a little more to, to give you some feedback in. So watch for those this week. There is a discussion board this week, so make sure you complete that in a quiz. So it's purposely a little light so that I can catch up and get back to you guys on on that projects and how how we're going to add some additional pieces to that. So out of your book, we look at a couple of things that I, that I think are kind of interesting when we look at it. So make sure you've read through chapters one through two. I know you guys have all enjoyed the reading. It's great. Look at Rocky Ridge Line Mountain or whatever we're calling it, RMO. I always want to call it Rocky Mountain and it's not. So we are looking at that idea of this, how do I deconstruct and start looking at from the user's viewpoint. And so one of the things that we do are these idea of user stories. And so that template that you see on there, as a blank, I want to blank so that blank. So it's not a game of apples and oranges or whatever that game is, but as a Maybe you're working in a call center and they're doing data entry. So as a data entry person, I want to enter credit cards so that I can do it quickly. So these are very quick ways we can start looking at that end users of what they want to do. So this gives us ideas then for the end goal of where we're headed to. Now, in your own project, depending on the system, it may be different in who's looking at it because that end user may well be the owner of the company, but it may also be you actually get to interact with and hopefully with, if the company has a couple of employees, you interact with those employees because the perception and knowledge of that employee is often different than the person who does the managing or owns the, the organization. And you've all probably already been in that situation. You're working somewhere and you go, man, I know more than the owner of this business does. Or you're working at Walmart and you go, man, I really know more than what Walmart does. So we want to get that end user knowledge. So this for an example. So as a shipping clerk, I want to ship an order as accurately as possible as soon as the order details are available. So one sentence says this is what I want to accomplish. So how do I get there? So couple of things that, that they've looked at, and this is probably by no means exhaustive. Available order details must pop up on the screen when they're available. A portable display and scanning device, and we've all seen those in warehouses, or if you see the UPS guy come to your house. So kind of portable device that can scan that item, sort items by bin location. So sometimes it may be that our, how we've got them organized isn't done very well, and we need to reorganize that. Maybe we need some way to identify locations. And so a really great way of, of company that does things like bins and, and is a really great example of how that can be really well done, if you go to Ikea. And I don't know if any of you guys in here have been in an Ikea before, but it's an interesting model because you go pick up your own stuff and it's all binned. And when you, when you look at an item, it's got bin tags and so that kind of an idea. How much items do we have in stock? And those that we don't have in stock, do we have an automatic back order process? In other words, what, how do we handle that? And different, in, different companies handle it differently. So if I try to order 10 of an item and they only have eight, some companies will automatically cancel the entire order. Some will say, hey, our, our process is we'll ship you the eight and we'll let you know when the other two will become available. Then we have to figure out what is the appropriate shipper based on weight, size, location. And what they don't have in here is cost. And I think that's an important figure in there, is not only does the customer want the lowest shipping cost, we would like the lowest shipping cost. Because most companies build in some kind of profit margin on shipping. 
because they know that they have to have people handle that merchandise. And so anytime somebody says, hey, I'm giving you free shipping, are they really? No, it costs them money to do that, money to handle that. So we, we need to think about that. And then print out a shipping label for the correct shipper. Now, this is assuming that all of those shippers show up every day to pick up items. So the other thing on a small volume might be notify shipper to pick up items. So once we generate a label. Now, some of the systems, like UPS, if I have a UPS shipping account, when I generate that label based on size, weight, criteria, and it generates a label, it automatically will alert UPS that, hey, we have a pickup here if we don't already have one scheduled. But that's the idea of a, of a user story. So from that, we can then start creating those use cases. And we introduced those, and I don't think we use that term use case in any of our other classes. So this is a unique place where we add some new content. So the use case is really just a verb and a noun, if you want to think about it that way. So it defines those functional requirements. And we want to take the system into, we're going to break it down or decompose into lists of these use cases. So we do this all over industry, whether it's in information systems, whether we're looking at a business office. So here, for example, we took that, that user statement, I need to ship items track shipments, and create a return. So that really is three different pieces. And so we try to break them down into, if you want to think about it, a single set of activities or a verb and a noun. So do something is the easiest way to do it. So here's our, our user. So when we think about these from different personnel. So here are our RMO, a customer that's a potential customer. What things do they do? So if I go to Amazon, I search for an item. I fill a shopping cart. Oftentimes, the way I decide which product I'm going to buy is view product ratings in those rankings, right? And I know we're, a lot of us are really guilty about that. And in fact, Amazon even gives us the ability to select only items that have a four out of five stars or whatever ranking we want. The shipping personnel ship items, track shipment, create item return. So very simple ways we can break those down into small enough pieces that we can handle figuring out how to implement them and looking at it. So part of that we have to do is we have to figure out who is going to use the system. Who are all the people that are going to use the system? What classifications of users are going to interact with the system? So is it just business sales analysts or whoever's in our list. No. We need to figure out all the potential users. And one of the things that often comes out of this is we find out that there are people that would like to use a system, they would like to be involved in this, but they don't have access. And I'll give you an example here at our college is, in theory, my understanding is we have a CRM, or Customer Relationship Management System, in the admissions office. But that data doesn't share. We didn't buy it with enough licenses so that it could extend to faculty and staff and other people who also interact with prospective admission students. In, in a great utopian world, when we get a request about a student, not we would be able to see when they got contacted. We made contact notes about how their visit went and all went into one big system. But we're not right now users on that system. So that's why when you look at this, this is a great idea of thinking about, hey, maybe there's a group of users who aren't already there. So let's go back to a, an example that, that I know was done several years ago, that of a hotel. That hotel had a manager and some data entry people that were in the front that handled the front desk. But they actually did all the time clock activities for all the, like the maintenance and everybody else instead of letting those users interact directly with the system. And so it led to some additional overhead. So if I'm working there cleaning rooms, I kept my own little timesheet. Then I had to go turn that in, and somebody else had to take that timesheet and then put it into their system. 
So we have that, that overlap where maybe what we really needed to do is, is find all the potential users that were in there. So then we need to identify those users. Where do they fit in this functional role? And then in some cases, we also break it down by what their, their level or their organizational level. So a lot of organizations are broken down very strictly into different hierarchies. And so we may need to do that. And then this gives us that ability to grab those individuals and we can start setting up things like interviews or surveys or other tools that we can find out what do they think they could add? What are their goals when they use the, the new system and the old system? What are, what are their goals in it? And that's where we start finding out that there's a lot of these things that maybe we missed. That, you know, we created a system and the CRM system works really great, except the most common thing people do in there takes four screens in. Can we bring that up to the front? Or maybe it's a bank system, and the, and the thing that the banks do the most commonly, somebody comes in and cashes a check, is buried in menus and not easy to get to. They have to go through, oh, I don't want to do a money order. Nope, I don't want to do this, and they have to get to there. So this, these user interviews, these end user interviews, are really a great tool to get there. So, so we're going to create these use cases. And then one of the things we want to do is we're going to look for duplicates. Because a lot of times what we also find out is that we have multiple people doing similar functions or similar use cases. Can we combine them? Can we make that system have one interface versus two? And sometimes it's broken down by that that organizational layers of this person is entering bills in this system, this person is entering here at a managerial level, and so we need to make sure that we have those. And then we look at this list and we bring it back to that owner, those stakeholders, those people who in theory know a lot about this corporation, and make sure that we haven't missed anything from the high-level viewpoint, and we can also get the low-level input. Because, again, if I'm, if I'm talking to somebody about how to put a wheel on a car, the president of Ford Motor Company probably is a very smart guy. Is he the one that knows the most about putting wheels on a Ford at, at Ford Motor Plant? Probably not. So we need kind of that high-level view and that low-level view so we can observe what's going on. So there is a formal system in our book called the Event Decomposition Technique. And so this has a little more formality to it. So the other method, just kind of grabbing things, this says we look at things and we do it in a very formalized system. So let me flip to here. So one of the things that happens is there are events that happen and we need to deal with those. So in almost any business we have things that happen based on some kind of a trigger. And so, in a lot of cases, that trigger is time. So your utility bill. Does everybody get a utility bill? They're not fun. You get them. Those are triggered off of a timed event. The reading of it's triggered on a time. The bill mailing you a bill is triggered on a time. Your payment then is triggered when it's received. All those kinds of things. So it most often, it seems like, it's a temporal event something based on time. But it can be other external events. So depending on the system, it could be an, some kind of external event. A customer does a search on our website. We don't know when that's going to occur, but it's an external trigger. If we're a security alarm company, somebody sends off, sets on off an alarm, that is an external event. So. External means something outside of our system, outside of our control. A temporal event is a time. And then there is a third one here called a state event. So when something happens, so it's inside of our system. So the biggest example of that is inventory. So we sold 10 widgets that left two in inventory. That triggers our system. Our system is set up to when widgets less than five, order more widgets. So it's some kind of an event that happens internally in our system. 
when employee XYZ hits a thousand hours, they get a bonus, maybe, or something. So some kind of internal event. So a lot of our things we look at from this external. So customer buys a product. We don't control that. We hopefully can influence with our sales and marketing and, and other tactics, but we don't control that. So we need to make sure that that event goes smoothly. And so part of that is so external agent wants to know about the product details. So we have that available information. So we have those pieces available. We also need to know if things change. And, and a lot of times we get frustrated sometimes. We go to check out and it says, hey, is this your, still your current address? Well, the reality is that probably means that in that system, in that company, somebody's gotten something shipped to the wrong address. So we want to know the appropriate place, new address, new phone. If, even if those customers don't complete that transaction, we want that new information so that we can send them mailing. Maybe, maybe we want to contact them further. So, and then we need external events from, in this case, we're selling products. How do we get that external event information? So, hey, I want to sell widgets, but now the company that produces those widgets for us has changed models or changed production. And so some way we can keep track of what's going on there. And so when we look at RMO, that's kind of what we're looking at is that overall piece of, how do I manage those external events? So, internal outputs. So, a lot of times these are based on time. So, reports. Yuck. Things about reports, generally on some kind of basis, every month, maybe quarterly. So, we look at here, admission reports get triggered and sent to us about how are we doing with prospective admissions? Because that's very important to us. So other things like payroll. Does everybody like to be paid? We forgot to turn on payroll. And in fact, as working in this field that I've been in for a while, the worst thing you can ever do to any company, screw up the payroll, and you will be beaten severely. Not kidding. Payroll is important. People want paid. Then, in addition, there's federal and state laws about making sure you get people paid on the agreed upon time. So it can get pretty ugly. If you don't get people paid, life's going to be bad. So other things, like you may want to send out bills, reminders. You may want to send out payments. All those kinds of things go external. And a lot of times, those are based on a, on a timed statement also. So you can break up internal and external where that stuff goes. So. This kind of gives us an example of what's going on. So our stuff, everything external, is wonderful. So here's our customer. He thinks about getting a new shirt. And I hope he's not buying that exact shirt because it's pretty ugly. But he drives to the mall. Customer tries on a shirt at Sears. Yeah. Customer goes to Walmart. Yeah. Customer tries on a shirt at Walmart. But it directly doesn't affect us, so nothing is changing on our system until that customer buys the shirt. When they buy that shirt and we're Walmart, now our system, something has actually initiated a change. Now I will say it's interesting that they use Sears as an example of a customer walking in and then leaving. If Sears right now, are they going to be around in another five years? Probably not. They are bleeding cash. I'm amazed they made it through Christmas, quite frankly. So this event, so similar, customer wants something, wants to look at it. But notice, customer requests a catalog. That's going to trigger something in our system. Customer checks availability. So if they log into our website and they check availability, that triggers an event. Customer places an order. Well, that's certainly going to trigger an event. Customer changes or cancels an order. Ooh. Maybe they increased how many shirts they wanted. Great. We've also gotten to the point where most customers now want to check on their orders, check on the status of that order. So 
not only do they want to know that, they want to look at tracking and they want to know, get an email or a text that, hey, my package has arrived or where is it or it's slowed down because of a snowstorm. Maybe the customer goes in and updates their account information. So all of these things affect our system. So it's one set of sequences to a customer, but every piece interacts with the system that we build if we're, if we're RMO. So one of the things when we go through here, we have these preconceived biases, and we go, man, they're never going to be able to change their username on an iPhone. And so we go in and we say, well, we don't think they can do that. So the reality is this is kind of pie in the sky at some points in here, where we go, you know, at some point the system will do that. If we would have done 10 years ago and said, most of our students are going to enroll on their phones, Systems analysts would have laughed at you and said, no, nah, that's not possible. Look at those tiny screens. That's not really that useful. And now over 50% of our students, how do we enroll? They enroll on their phone. Now, So don't worry about the limits that you think are existing in technology right now. So all of these things used to be hard to do. System crash, database recovery. That used to be a couple of week process in a lot of corporations. If your database crashed, now with virtual technologies and using, using things like VMware Motion, I spin up a new database, pull the old ones, put it off on another server somewhere else, five minutes and we're done in some cases. So there are ways that, that these things that used to be technology issues are not really, really anywhere. So we do have some things that, that force our hand a little bit, changing passwords. Because we know that people are idiots with passwords. So we can put in rules. We can force password changes. We can force two-factor authentication and those kinds of things. So what we want to assume when we go in here, we have that idea of perfect technology. We know that everything is going to work exactly as we intended. Now, we know that that not, isn't always, always the case. But this event decomposition, so we look at the external, so we look at all those external pieces, and then we create those use cases for all those externals. Then we look at timed events, and we try to break it down by which items are going to create a timed event. And in there, we create that, that use case, that person and an activity, what's going to happen. And then we have that idea of state events. So in other words, things that happen not externally, not based on time, but based on some kind of other trigger. So inventory is usually the one that pops up the most, but there are, there are hundreds of other ones. So even if I'm building a system that interacts with my building, which is getting more and more common now that we have that Internet of Things, a state event might be somebody opens the front door and suddenly lights and air conditioning come on in the room. So if I'm doing a hotel, that one's actually becoming very real. If you've checked into a hotel recently, and a newer hotel. Is the air conditioner running when you walk in the room? Are the lights on? They're all computer controlled and they don't even turn on the, the HVAC system until they sense occupancy in a lot of cases. They're trying to save money and have they put that in there. So that state event, anything that's going to change not based on a specific time but it's internal. We need to figure out how we're going to break them down. And so one of the things that comes up is most of you have had project management already. And in fact, we, we talk a lot about those pieces in project management. You were tasked with breaking down projects. Well, this is very similar. You're breaking them down into small enough ideas that we can both implement them and quantify them Here's an example written in the easy to read pink. So use case is create a customer account. Well, we all know what that's going to do, but we need to figure out who it involves. New customer account data. So somebody creates a new customer account. The system then is going to assign it a account number.
create some kind of a record and it creates an account record for that. So when you go in and you create that customer account, these are the things that happen in the back end then to support that. If I need to look up a customer, so whoever it is, whether it's internal or external, enters a customer account number and the system retrieves and displays customer account data. So from an external viewpoint, most of the times it'd be enter a username, your email or something else, and you can look up your information. Process account adjustment. So our ordering process didn't go very well. Maybe there was a price change. Maybe a back order change something. The actor enters the order number. The system retrieves it. We can manipulate it. And then it creates not only a new record, but a transaction record. So in other words, we're keeping a rolling log of those kinds of changes. So we can go back in and look and see that, yep, Amber went in and changed the quantity on that order. So even from the accounting standpoint, when we talk about user controls, this is really a great area to start thinking about. Oh, anytime we make adjustments or changes, do we need to make sure that there's some kind of accountability in that? So what if, what if we were able to make the change? So we said, yep, we're going to change from a quantity of 10 to a quantity of 8. But we're going to pick on Amber because she's sitting here. Amber's kind of sneaky and has figured out that she can refund that money into her own account instead of another customer's account. Do those kinds of things happen? Yeah. So those transaction logs get pretty important. So here's an entire list of some use cases then. And so part of this is identifying who does these. So search for an item. Well, we know the customer search for an item. But a customer service rep or even an in-store sales rep may also search for an item. Create a store sale. Well, in-store sale is going to be that store sales representative is going to be the actor. A phone sale is going to be that customer service phone rep. But check out a shopping cart, so now you're on the online piece, that's going to be that customer. So identifying who the actors are in some of these and making sure that it's all written down and documented gets to be an important part. And that's the sad, horrible part of all of these. That documentation piece is really the, the nuts and bolts behind there. It's the tedious piece of this. So we can sit down and brainstorm these, but then documenting. And different companies have different ways they want to do this. So if you're working without a, without a formal system, in a company, this may be, you may be creating the formal system. So here's some more use cases of the order fulfillment. So now we're back on the actually shipping the items. So shipping items, the user is the shipping department. But rate and comment on the product? Well, that's really the customer. Maybe suggestions, review suggestions would be maybe a management order. So you're starting to look at. How do these use cases now get assigned? We know that we need to ship a product. Who is responsible for it? How does it work? So now we have another example here of the customer account subsystem. So in this case, it's that how do I deal with my customers? So things like updating an account system, sending messages. So a lot of times what's really popular we don't have time to wait on hold 30 minutes, but there's a chat system or a send a message feature in a lot of online ordering. Great, now we can send a message. So view mountain bucks, so they have some reward program, how to transfer them back in. So reward programs are really, really handy in a lot of, a lot of corporations. And in fact, from your other business classes, why would we want to use a reward program? What does it do for us? What well, does track customers, but there's something else with it. It locks you into that particular. Hmm? Brand it does. It creates that idea of brand loyalty in a lot of cases. It locks you into that vendor and says, hey, I, I'm going to give you a discount or some kind of product, and I'm gonna, you're going to reciprocate by being loyal to me as a customer. Because a lot of us are very price loyal, but not brand loyal. And so it's a way to try to incentivize that and convert you from one to the other.
So, and again, as we go through here now, so the marketing subsystem, so this is those ideas about products and promotions and all those. Again, now we see that that's the marketing department or maybe the merchandising department. And then these, the use cases over here, this reporting subsystem. So we built this system. We need to make sure that it's working accurately. And we need to have a pulse on our company. Now, I will say a lot of companies over-report internally. So it's, we're worried about every day versus a longer-term goal. And sometimes that, that happens. But if I want to produce a sales trends report, well, the use case says that's going to be the marketing department that has the ability to work as that actor. But some of these produce a promotional partner activity report, whatever that is. Not only can marketing do it, but also management has access to that. And so we, can, we have multiple actors in a lot of these cases. All right, I'm going to stop here for today talking about this. So make sure you have read about use case diagrams, UML. So it's one of the many different models we're going to look at in here. So make sure you have read and you look at what UML is. UML is one that's, that's very widely used. And it gives us a way that we can, we can look at these use cases and we can put them onto some kind of a chart. And we're also going to introduce you to a couple of other features of these. So we're, we started with just a use case. Now we added who the actor is. Now we're going to add in that, that differentiation between that actor and the system. Who does what? And you're going to see how we... We start looking at that. So as a reminder, there is a discussion board this week. That discussion board is about the use of project management tips, tools, techniques that everybody in here should have taken. So make sure you do that discussion board. If you're in class, we'll probably have time to work on it in class on campus. There is a quiz. And then there is a, a, do I have an assignment in this week? I do. Oh, yes, the State Patrol one. That one's a little more entertaining. It talks about tickets and that process. And so hopefully that'll, that'll give you some, an idea of, of how some of these options work. If nothing else, it'll give you a little more details into how a State Patrol tends to operate. And nobody will get a ticket. All right, if you're traveling today, it seems like it's going to get a little icky. If you're going toward the north, toward Lincoln or Omaha, be careful. It is pretty, pretty rough out there. All right. Let's get out of here and have a great day, guys.